Uh, my name is Joan Balk. I'm from the St. Mary's County Library. And with us tonight, we have Jim Gibb, and he is with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And he already he also has his own business, business, I can't even speak tonight, his own business, which is Gibb Archaeology Consulting. So he is very versed in this field, and he is always open and willing to answer questions. So I, I said a few minutes ago, if anybody has anything that they want to ask him about while he is giving his presentation, feel free to hop right in. If you have a question and you would like to put it in the chat, I'll follow up with all the questions at the end of the program and I'll, I'll read them off to Jim to, at the same time. But our program is pretty laid back and he, you know, Jim always wants to encourage the conversation, so please feel free to be a part of it. And I mentioned before, if you are comfortable leaving your video on, you can leave your video on, but we ask that you keep your audio off unless you have a question, and that way we don't have all the background noise. So with that, Jim, take it away. Well, hello, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me well. If not, uh please indicate somehow, unmute yourself and say, I can't hear you. Um, I don't have my earphones uh, plugged in and I'd rather not if I don't have to. So good evening, yes, I'm Jim Gibb, I'm an archeologist. Um, I uh, actually have a whole series of talks uh, for the, really, I guess the rest of this year. <laughs> so anybody wants to tune in, last Monday of every month, we have an archeology span talk. And, and there's more beyond that, so I got lots to say. Uh, tonight, I'm gonna talk about uh, two sites and focus on one. Now, I'll give you a little background on it once I've uh, pulled up the, um, the slideshow. Uh, there we go. Guess I have to make this go away. And you are you trying to make the left side of the screen disappear? Yeah, there you go. That's good enough now. I can see there you go. That. So <clears throat> mostly what I'm going to talk about this evening are a pair of 17th century sites in southern uh, Calvert County. And just to give you a little background uh, for those who uh, perhaps unaware. Uh, this area was settled by Europeans in Maryland, what we now call Maryland, was settled by Europeans uh, beginning in the 1630s. Uh, settlers rapidly moved up and down the coast and up the major uh, rivers, uh, occupying mostly coastal lands. And that was occurring mostly in the 1650s through 1680s. Uh, as they uh, gobbled up land along the coast, the more the uh, more productive land, the land that was accessible to water transportation, people increasingly moved into the interior where the lands, typically the soils weren't quite as good for tobacco. And of course, it was a lot more trouble getting your product to market because you had to travel overland prior to the existence of any kind of road system. Uh, this map of 1673 was made by a Bohemian, uh, part of what would have been Czechoslovakia in my youth and uh, might be a country in and of itself now, I don't know. <clears throat> but he was a uh, merchant, uh, uh, mostly stationed in New York. And he produced this map in the late 1660s and gave it as a present, so far as I could tell, to Lord Baltimore. Lord Baltimore, as a result, gave uh, Augustine Hermit a big chunk of land up at the head of the bay, uh, what became Bohemia Manor. And so there are all these sites along the coast, and you can see on this map all these little squares, all these little, um, let me see if I can pull up a pointer here so it'd be easier to see. There we go. So there are these little boxes all on the coast. These are symbols suggesting plantations. Now you couldn't use this map to actually find a 17th century plantation. Partly it's not accurate enough, not precise enough. But also I think Herman was using 
these symbols to sort of to give an idea of where people were living, just to show that they were focused on the coastline. Uh, they don't necessarily indicate actual plantations. And I, I've got colleagues who disagree on that point, but uh, that's that's my view of things. <clears throat> so this is uh, Point Patience in, in, uh, Cal in Calvert County, and this is the Naval Rec Center right here, this oblique aerial photograph. The area we're gonna be talking about is just up in here uh, that has been uh, redeveloped as a kind of a retirement community, I think. Uh, but at the time, uh, before we started doing the archaeology, it was a cultivated field. So here we go, coming soon, Patuxent Point. Uh, this is the um, uh, Merrick Brothers, who's still active in the area. And they wanted to develop this 100-acre tract. And uh, by a law that existed, a regulation in, in Calvert County at the time, uh, they were required to do an archaeological survey, and they paid to have one done uh, by uh, another company, not mine. And that survey uh, located a number of sites, including a 17th century site dating probably the 1650s. Uh, after the report was submitted, they, they excavated the site and everything, it produced a very nice report. Uh, but the then Southern Maryland regional archeologist, Julie King, looking over the report, thought, it looks like there's another 17th century site out there. And she went out to the field, out to this cultivated field, and walked around and said, yep, there's definitely a field uh, site there. But nobody wanted to approach the developer and say, we want you to pay another $100,000 or whatever it was to excavate the first site. We have another one, we want you to pay for that. So what they did, what she did was she got permission to work on the site, but she secured funding from the state of Maryland in the form of two $10,000 plus dollar grants. And eventually we got another $2,500 from uh, Calvert County. So that's kind of the background to all of this. Here's that field, here's an aerial photograph of it. And it shows you in the lower portion is what was called a Compton site. And this is the one that was excavated uh, by a, a firm uh, like mine. Jim, uh, I have a quick question for yes. you. If the if you had had an archaeology company, or not you, but if the company had hired an archaeology company to do, um, you know, a, a plan of the site, how was Julia able to determine that there was a, a 17th century uh, plantation there previously? What she did was she looked at the report of the original survey where an archeologist had walked all these fields here when they were cultivated and mapped in artifacts that were on the surface. Okay. And she found that over in this corner, there was some 17th century artifacts. And this is 800 feet away from this site. So okay. clearly there had to be another site here. Okay. So that's what, that's what started all of this. Now, uh, this is not a Smithsonian project. This, we did this back uh, a little over 30 years ago, actually now, uh, before I was involved with the Smithsonian. But some of the work we did here influenced what we do at the Smithsonian now. Uh, this was largely a volunteer effort because we had very little funding. I was the only paid person uh, the assistant Southern Maryland Regional Archaeologist, Stuart Reeve, Dr. Stuart Reeve would come out. Uh, one of Julie's assistants, uh, Patricia McGuire would come out. But the people who excavated the site by and large were volunteers. Some, uh, most with very little, if any, ex prior experience in archaeology. So uh, this is an old map, uh, can't get it a new version of it because the landscape looks so much different now, but this is the Patuxent River. This is Stevens Creek. This is the Compton site that was excavated in the late 1980s. And this is the Patuxent Point site excavated, I think, 1989, 1990. Uh, you could see the creek comes up in here. It's probably filled in with a lot of silt. But at one point, this would have been navigable. And you would have just, you know, you could load stuff up on boats in that creek and go out to the Patuxent River. And from there, you can go out to ships waiting out in the bay and load up your tobacco. The background of the site's a little, a little weird. Um, 
the company that originally did the work on the Compton site, the reason they called it the Compton site was because they went to the Maryland State Archives, uh, looked into original uh, land patent records and surveyors' descriptions. And in the historian's opinion, the land that the site was located on was called Compton. And it was patented uh, in 1651 and then in the possession of a guy named Antoine Lecomte in 1656, and that's how it got its name. And so in the land records, it's referred to as Compton. When I looked at the survey records of that property, though, it made no mention of Stevens Creek, which I thought was very odd because that was a natural boundary, you know, for the north side of the site. I recall the drawings I showed you earlier, the site in question is located around here, and the other one's over here, and here's Stevens Creek. And there was no mention of it in the surveyor's record. So I looked at the next tract to the north, which was called William Stevens Land, and sure enough, it mentions Stevens Creek as the north boundary of the site. So uh, we know that the uh, site belong, uh, was in the possession of William Stevens and his wife, Magdalene. Remember in the 17th century, right on up into the 1750s, everybody in Maryland was a renter. Only one person owned land, and that was Lord Baltimore. In the 1750s, the last Lord Baltimore started selling land in fee simple, uh, the way we do it today. You actually purchased land, and that was that. Prior to that, you rented the land, and you paid a rent on it twice a year. It was a nominal rent. And you also swore an oath of fealty to Lord Baltimore. And what that meant was you said, Lord Baltimore rules this place and he owns the land. And if you fail to take that oath, your land would be could be esqueted. That is, taken away from you and given back to Lord Baltimore. With whatever improvements you had on it, whatever livestock you had on it, whatever crops you had in the field, it all went to him. So you had to pay your rent twice a year and you had to take that oath of fealty. So getting started, um, we found this uh, energetic young man um, to do the work, who apparently knows how to use a transit. Uh, yes, that is me in my younger days. Nice gams, full head of dark hair, uh, walrus mustache. Um, working out in this plowed field. And what we did was we set up a grid across the site. That is, oh, I don't know, it was probably every 20 feet or whatever, we'd stick a nail on the ground. It looked like the, turning the whole site into essentially a checkerboard. And then within each of those squares, we got a bunch of volunteers to <laughs> spend their day bent over like this. Uh, look, look at this young woman, she's almost ready to fall over. Um, picking up artifacts and putting them in a bag for each of those squares. And what we could then do is clean those artifacts, count them, weigh them, and look at how many, say, ceramics were in each of those 20 by 20 foot squares. And then just look for those squares that had the highest densities, and that would be where we would dig. In this case, we're actually, we've just expanded our collection area. We'd already started, we'd already collected this area over here and started excavating. This is an old excavation unit. And you can see the oyster shell uh, that we've discarded. So just imagine doing this for eight hours. Uh, lunch is really welcome when it comes around. Again, these are virtually all volunteers and there's a long list of them. Uh, Claude Bowen, who's president of our state society, who's volunteering. Stephen Israel, uh, Denise Stevenson, Al Labish, Paula Mask. I mean, it's just too many for me to name. And of course it's been over 30 years. Um, and what we would do is in those areas of high concentration of artifacts, we dug five foot by five foot squares, just digging through the plow zone, less than a foot deep, screening the soil. That's what these folks are doing here, screening the soil. That's me shoveling it. And we do the same thing. Where, which of those squares had the highest concentrations of artifacts? And so here's the site. Um, each of these little squares represents an excavation unit that we dug. They're all about, uh, there's I think just a little over 60 of them. And these are some of the features that we found, these uh, stippled in areas or archeological features where somebody had dug into the soil that has since been plowed over, but dug into it 
and that hole was then filled with soil and trash. And we also found the outline, and we'll go into this in a moment, of a, a dwelling, a dwelling house. Using a um, statistical software, we we create a simulation. We took all that data from all those squares, and we uh, had the computer generate essentially a map of where the trash was concentrated. And so it gave us, it suggested that there was a large midden area, trash area over here that I've divided into two parts, one over here and one over here. Now, after the fact, it was pretty clear to me anyway, once we dug the site that this is, these aren't areas where people just threw trash out the door or out the window. These trash areas exist because there were uh, pits, holes beneath the surface that had been filled with trash. And the plow for the last couple of hundred, several hundred years has been going over those pits, uh, you know, trimming them down, truncating them, and turning the artifacts that are in them up into the plowed soil. So what these areas really do suggest is that these are where some of these uh, trash filled pits are located. And of course, we have our dwelling here still in outline. 800 feet to uh, pretty much the west, right up along the Patuxent River, the other company that had come through had excavated the site. And what they did was once they were through with their surface collecting and plow zone sampling, they stripped all the plowed soil off the site and found a bunch of what we call post holes. And these are these are spots maybe three foot in, in length and width where somebody dug a hole, put a wooden post in the ground and backfilled the hole. At some point, that post was either pulled out or rotted in place. And so when we strip off the plowed soil down to the bare subsoil, we can see them kind of sticking out as these anomalies. They're often referred to as stains, although they're not really stains because they have three dimensions. They go down several feet. And then once you, once you find these things, then you simply draw a bunch of lines and connect the dots. And what you have here are three dwellings, uh, numbers one, three, and four. And we know they're dwellings because each of them has what we call a chimney bay at, at one end. And this is where there'd be a fireplace. So they stuck wooden posts in the ground. They'd weave branches between those posts. And then they would dig a hole to get just loam, just silt loam, mix it with water, and they would plaster the chimneys. So it'd be, you know, be plastered. And eventually, because the fire heats, you know, dries out that clay, it starts cracking, exposing the underlying wood. It's all ripped out and new plaster is applied and the old plaster is maybe dumped into a pit. So that's the Compton site. And like I said, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that one but it probably dates to around the 1650s into maybe the 1660s, 1670s. And that probably was the original plantation site of William and Magdalene Stevens, uh, their two sons, and as I recall, three servants. Uh, so here's, here's the Compton site, same thing where they did this uh, computer simulation and suggested that they had four surface middens places where people threw trash on the ground in amongst the buildings. And there's this little building here that's probably some sort of storehouse or meat house. So we've got that site to compare it to the new site, the Patuxent Point site. So after we did all our sampling, we brought in a, a road grader and it basically went back and forth and stripped off all the soil that had been dis uh, disturbed by plowing over the last you know, 350 years. In doing so, you know, once they did that, we'd get down on the ground. Again, I'm here. Uh, this is Monique Renoir. She, we actually paid her. Everybody else here is a volunteer. And once the machine got through scraping off the soil, we'd clean it down with shovels and trowels. And so what we're doing here is defining these spots where somebody had dug a hole into the ground 350 years earlier and either filled it with trash or put a wooden post into it. These are all volunteers, and they several of them had done this kind of work before for uh, certain you know, for state agencies. And to give you an idea of how this project influenced what we do at Smithsonian now, 
when we got through cleaning off these features and mapping them, one of the volunteers, Denise Stevenson, asked me, well, who's going to dig these? <laughs> and I looked at her. Somebody should have caught my face on, uh, with a camera because uh, there must have been quite an expression. I was like, who the hell do you think is going to dig them? <laughs> you guys are going to dig them. Well, they hadn't had that experience before. The professional archaeologists would always kind of push them out of the way, and now's, now's the professional work. We have to do this. Uh, and they had quite a few remarks about that sort of practice. But anyway, the people who exposed these features and mapped them are the same people who excavated them. This is probably our largest feature uh, on the site, taken from above, obviously. As I recall, it's about 20 feet in diameter, chock full of oyster shells. This is a massive pit filled with oyster and other trash. And you can see even from cleaning the soil off the top, well, all the uh, oyster shell, it's the, even in the back dirt. This is a more typical kind of feature we'd find, a classic post hole mold. You can see this yellow, yellowish brown, almost uniform soil. That has never been disturbed by people before. In fact, probably never seen by people before. But there was a topsoil on top of that. And then somebody came along and dug a hole through the topsoil and into the subsoil, maybe more than one layer of subsoil, different colors and textures, put a wooden post in the ground and backfilled it. And so we, we get is this mixture of soils. You could see different colors in there and you can't see different textures, but take my word for it, it's different textures of soil there as well. And then there's this circular area of more, uni more uniformly dark soil. This is where the wooden post went into the ground. The trowel here is about five inches, give you some idea of the scale. And here we are mapping them. This is Denise Stevenson, who was in her early 60s at the time. She has since moved down to Florida. I don't know if she's still with us. Uh, but we used the mapping frame and we'd hand draw everything, creating a map. And then all uh, we'd use a uh, transit uh, to tie everything together so we'd have one uh, common map for everything. So this is what we produced. And you can see, here's the building. Um, I need to get this out of my way. So we've got a 40 foot by I think 15 foot building divided into two. So there's one room here and there's red and earth here suggesting that it, it was heated. There was some sort of hearth here. And then we have this other room here with what we call a chimney bay. This is not usable space, it was occupied by a hearth and a chimney. And you can see we've got reddened earth here. These are actually pits, uh, storage pits, probably for root vegetables like potatoes and carrots and onions that would freeze if left outside. Ignore this because it's a Native American hearth that predates the site by several hundred years. It just happens to be there. Uh, we have a pit here. We have a pit here with some posts around it. I think this was actually a privy hole. Uh, but there's clearly some sort of structure in here. We're only getting part of it. And then we have our large shell fill pit here. So that's what we expose just by stripping the cloud zone, troweling it down and mapping it. These are what the typical structural post holes look like. So with, you know, we got all kinds of post holes, are they? but we have some really big ones here that are meant to support the main building in some sort of addition here. So here's what uh, typically what they look like, a large hole with a mold. Same thing here. What was interesting with this one and probably with this one too, is it looks like somebody dug into them to replace the wooden post at some point. These posts, of course, would eventually rot. And so what you'd have to do is you get, you know, a long pole and a rock or something and you lever up the corner of the house. It's not that hard, believe it or not. It doesn't require a lot. But you lever up a corner of the house, you wrench or dig out and wrench free the rotted post, and you stick in another one. And then you let the corner of the house down and go to the next. So that's what we see here. And that suggests this house was maintained over a number of years. Um, this is that large shell filled pit, uh, pit again. Uh, we're trawling down. This is Dr. Henry Miller, uh, uh, Chief Curator Emeritus, I think his title is now at St. Mary City, but he was the director of research at Historic St. Mary City for many years. Silas Hurry, who is the uh, uh, 
director of the lab, he also just retired. And Gretchen Sealstad, who was a volunteer, died some 20 odd years ago, but she used to volunteer for the Smithsonian too, for CERC. We've excavated at this point one quarter of that shell filled pit. Now we're not even down to the bottom and look what we've got. Bone here, bone here, large piece of ceramic here. This is a cow metacarpal, a foot bone from a cow. Looks like a rib here, another rib here. We have the handle of a clay saucepan here. It's flipped over, but this is the handle and the bottom here is gone. And this is uh, essentially a, a jug or, or mug, a, a drinking vessel made in the uh, Rhineland area of Europe. You can see the handle here. Here's part of the rim here. We're missing most of it, of course. And of course, lots of oyster shell. The neat thing about the oyster shell is that it neutralizes soil acids. And in doing so, it allows the bone, which is calcium based, to preserve well. If these soils didn't have the shell, they're very, the soils are very acidic, a lot of this bone may have disappeared and have disappeared pretty quickly uh, long before we came along. Um, there we go. So here's that entire quarter taken out. Eventually we would excavate the entirety of the pit. And there it is. That's uh, one of our volunteers, Paula Mask, in the middle of the hole, just doing the final cleanup. So this hole almost certainly was excavated. Um, it was a source of clay, of soil, to make daub for the fireplace. And it's a little, it's different from the site, uh, the other site, Compton, which had a number of smaller pits. Here, they just seem to have one large pit. Uh, recording is essential to what we do. Um, archaeology requires really two things to be considered archaeology, among other things. Um, well, several things. It needs scientific questions that we're trying to answer. It needs detailed recording in the field and in the lab. And it needs a report. If there isn't a technical report that describes what we did and what we found, I don't know what it is, but it's not archaeology. So this is an important step in what we're doing. One of the smaller pits we found had these lenses of ash. We've just excavated half of it at this point. I don't actually dig features this way anymore, but this is how we were doing it back then. You could see these lenses of fine ash coming through. And they, they're sloping down to the left. That suggests that they were thrown in from the right. Well, the dwelling is just a few feet to the right of this pit. This is almost certainly a privy, an outhouse. And they were disposing of the ash in here, not because they had no other place to dump it, but they were using it as a deodorizer. And in fact, there's a lot of stinky stuff in here that isn't necessarily human excrement. Uh, there's a lot of fish remains, uh, fish scale and fish bone, and these lenses of ash. There's even also part of a case bottle here, a square bottle, and some ceramics sticking out of here. Uh, right now, um, one of the things we're doing at Smithsonian is we're reanalyzing this material and uh, the material from a number of colonial sites that I've excavated over the last 30 years uh, and as uh, research for a book that's in preparation. <clears throat> so this stuff is still on, on the front burner. We're, this is an earlier part where we're excavating that feature and you can see all the pottery that's coming out of here. Most of these actually mend. I wonder if I have a picture of that. There it is. They're rather strange uh, looking bowl. It doesn't look like anything else I've excavated in the region over the years. Um, among the, since, sorry to talk about artifacts, uh, some examples of the kinds of things we're finding, glass beads, uh, not a huge number, but they're there. Uh, this type in particular is quite common on 17th century sites, kind of red on the outside, dark green on the inside. Um, how these things functioned, who was wearing them, were they things that they traded to local Native Americans for maybe venison or something like that? We, we don't know. We're working on it, but we don't know. We also found from that actually possibly pri privy, we found this glass prunt, and you can see a close-up view of it here. This is a decorative piece that would have been welded onto a fancy wine glass. Um, 
when a glass is being made. It's called a rom the glass is called a romer, R-O-E-M-E-R. And it's just a drinking glass. Um, folks used to think, at least I hope they used to think this, that this was an indication of wealth that people had this sort of expensive glassware. But in uh, Dutch areas of North America, these are quite common in taverns. Uh, so they might be more expensive than your average tumbler, but uh, they don't necessarily indicate great wealth. And even if they did, we only found one glass. You know, if we found more, would they be wealthier? You know, we don't know. We also recovered uh, several uh, Native American made tobacco pipes that were almost certainly made for a European clientele. Uh, these are common throughout the Chesapeake area, somewhat enigmatic. Uh, we refer to this type as the running deer pipe because it looks like a deer that's impressed to decoration on the bowl of this, this tobacco pipe. And this one just has geometric designs. <clears throat> it is one of the indications we have that even in the 1650s to 1680s, uh, settlers are still interacting, at least commercially, with Native Americans. We know from records that some settlers actually essentially hired Native Americans to go out and hunt deer for them. I don't know why that came up. There we go. Uh, a somewhat larger selection of pipes. Again, here's a one of that running deer pipe. Um, we have what's called a pikeman and Minerva pike, uh, pipe here with a soldier on one side and a woman in a flowing gown on the other. There's some rabbits and other sort of wildlife on it. Uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues think that these are Dutch made, but when you look at the Dutch sites in that same period excavated up uh, north in Albany and uh, other parts of the Northeast, they don't come up with these pipes. And if you go to the French Canadian sites, the Acadian sites, uh, they don't show up there either. So it suggests that they are English pipes. Um, what they meant, who knows? Yeah. At the bottom of that large pit, that 25 foot diameter pit, 20 foot diameter pit, we found this. Actually, we found two of them. One was bent in half. Uh, this is the really good one. And it was a little startling at first because when we, when we, when we recovered it, all I could really see on it were the initials AR. And AR, you know, the first thing that jumps to mind is Anne Regina, Queen Anne. Well, Queen Anne wasn't queen until, I don't know, something like 1701 to 1711 when she died, thereabouts, decades after when we thought the site was, ex was actually occupied. But after clean cleaning it up and using a, an artifact guide that only the British would create, we found that it says Ilemster, which is in, I think, Somersetshire, England, the south of England, and it's Alice, Alice Rowe is what's on the back here. So of that uh, 1660 something, Ilemster, Alice Rowe. And what it is, is it's, it's a token. It's a copper token used, you know, when you buy a bunch of beer at Dallas's restaurant, <laughs> this is your change. This is what you got back. The problem is it's made of copper, so it has no intrinsic value, unlike gold or silver. So when you wind up uh, in uh, colonial Maryland, you have this thing, it's worth exactly nothing, it has absolutely no value. And that's probably why it ended up in the, with the rest of the trash. Also recovered from the site is you know, partial pairs of dividers. Now, this is sort of a gen general tool used by a lot of folks, carpenters, surveyors, and what have you. Uh, but it's, yeah, it would have been considered a fairly nice instrument of its time. It's definitely, you can see file marks on it. It's very nicely made of brass. Uh, what it's doing here, uh, we don't know. Maybe as we continue with our reanalysis, we'll come up with some ideas. Lots of iron tools, including hoes uh, and adz, you know, for you know, like a grubbing hoe, basically for digging. Um, a, um, a part of a hook for a garment. Um, the closest thing that we commonly use today is on women's brassiers, you know, the clip on the back to be a hook and eye, and that's really how this worked. It's not from a brassiere, it's from some other article of clothing, I guess. Actually, Susan Langley, who's in on our broadcast, is our state underwater archeologist and also knows quite a lot about fabrics and such, and 
she might have a better idea what they're used for. Uh, sorry about it. these are old drawings. They're all done by hand uh, 30 years ago. Uh, my effort at technical drawing, but these are sort of reconstructions of parts of vessels we found. We didn't. Really, I can't recall us finding anything that was complete, uh, but we could find fragments enough to link the top of a vessel with the bottom, even if we couldn't actually glue it together. And with that, we can reconstruct it. So this is a square, what's called a case bottle, with a pewter top with threading. This is a, you know, essentially a screw top bottle, uh, probably from the 1660s. There are sorts of wine bottles and had some ceramic vessels as well. Interesting from the Compton site, uh, to the west, which is a little bit earlier, probably by about 10 years, we found an, a, a number of vessels that are clearly Dutch. Um, you know, we know that this kind of pot was popular, was uh, made in uh, the city of Bergen op Zoom. Uh, we see the skillet here. I showed you a photograph of it kind of belly up in the pit earlier with the handle. Uh, these are also, you know, common Dutch vessels. Uh, we don't have anything similar at that time from uh, England. Identifying these vessels and dating them is made somewhat easier because there was a, what we now call the Dutch genre uh, paintings of the time from uh, I think around the 1630s through 1660s, 70s, maybe later. And there were kind of uh, drawings of everyday life and they shouldn't be taken too much so hard. They were really moralistic. Uh, I mean, these are people getting drunk, you know, they're wearing funny hats and, you know, it's a slovenly mess. There are animals all over the place. There's a jug knocked over, a cat over here. These people were, people are up to no good, no doubt. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a lesson in morality for uh, the viewer. But uh, they used pots that were available in the Netherlands at the time as props when they were painting. So these are real artifacts that they painted. You could see our Bergen op Zoom type pot here, and yeah, you know, it's probably a skillet here and big jug here. So we can use these paintings to help date some of the stuff we're finding and, and determine where it's from. Um, I'm gonna go very briefly into bones. I've just recently stuck this in here because I wanted to, this is something we're really focused on now, but comparing uh, the bones we're finding from different sites of the period. Uh, don't get too worked up about what all this means. I mean, we've got sheep, cow, and pig along the bottom here, and what percentage of the assemblage of each of these sites uh, is from sheep, cow, and pig. And the only thing you need to take away from this is they're all over the place. There's a lot of variability there. These people, although living at pretty much the same time, aren't eating the same foods in the same amounts. And I have just two more of these to show you. Um, when we're looking at these sites, Patuxent Point's the one with the orange dots. It, this one, you know, there's a lot of similarity here. You know, these folks are doing a little fouling, a little bit of trapping, uh, a little bit of fishing, but you know, of the game animals they're eating, most of it's deer. And even at that, it's less than 7%. These folks are eating mostly cow and pig and a little bit of sheep. And it runs counter to what we might think for the period. We go, well, you know, they're, they're on the frontier. These are settlers or they're just getting started. They're probably eating mostly game animals. And, you know, clearly they're eating a little bit of fish and game, but not a lot. Um, really what they're eating is, is pork and beef, which is what they wanted to eat back in the old world, but a lot of people couldn't get because they couldn't afford, or they didn't eat in very large quantities. They really didn't come here for the venison. Most people in Europe, uh, certainly in the what's now the UK, probably went through their entire lives without tasting venison because deer were, you know, that was for the aristocracy. Uh, when they came here, uh, we've got a couple of period references to basically Oh no, not venison again. I mean, these people really weren't, they weren't interested in eating venison for the most part. They wanted old world animals. And finally, just looking at the fish here, again, Patuxent points to all the Lord, the orange dots here. Uh, a lot of sheep's head. 
Uh, and there are other, you know, uh, rockfish and yellow perch that show up, but yeah, you know, a lot of sheep's head here. And on some other sites, we've got more in the way of the Moronidae, which are rockfish and yellow perch. But again, um, not a huge amount. Okay, so getting back to the site, getting really to another phase of the site. We initially stripped the site using a big road grader. And at some point, uh, Julie King, who was running this project as Southern Maryland Regional Archaeologist and person who secured the money for it, uh, she wanted to strip off more of the site, make sure we weren't missing anything. Are there other buildings? Are there fence lines and that sort of thing? So we used a smaller machine, a great all to do that. It was you know, a little more economical. We can hit small areas. Well, we were doing this and you know, they were doing this. Uh, Dennis Polk, then of uh, the chief archeologist at Mount Vernon was out volunteering with a number of his field school students. And he was standing by me and we were kind of chatting. I was fellow wizards do talking about archeology. span And because I wasn't paying attention, the great all operator went a little bit further than I really wanted him to. And in doing so exposed this feature here, which had several sides with a short side and another side and another side, same thing. It looked like for all the world, like the upper part of a coffin. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it was clearly a coffin. Uh, Dennis loved it. He loves working on these things. I was um, I'm displeased uh, because we had a lot of work to do with what we were supposed to be doing. The last thing we needed was a cemetery. And yet there it is. And I think for the first talk I did in the series, uh, I talked about cemeteries in the region. Uh, and I talked a little bit about the Patuxent Point one. So it's a little redundant uh, to a certain extent. But here's the house. Here's the privy. Here's the Indian feature. Here's the big shell fill pit. And over here is the cemetery, not far away, uh, what, 50 feet maybe. And the thing is we have all these grave shafts and they don't seem to have any rhyme or reason to them. They have a, they, you could see patterns now because I colored them in to make it easier to see. But you could see in the green, we've got one series of grave shafts that are more or less pointed to magnetic north. We have these red ones, which are more or less pointed to east, which is what we'd expect on a cemetery, as well as this blue one here. And then we have these purple ones up here that are kind of west of north. There's no real pattern here. And yet when we excavate cemeteries, we expect to find the graves more or less uh, head at the west end, feet at the east end. The idea is that, you know, when it's all done and over with, the sun arises in the east, the sun being the symbol for Jesus Christ, and everybody sits bolt upright in their graves to greet the Lord, and that's how it works. Well, these guys, for the most part, are oriented east-west. They also overlap. A number of these dig into one another. Let's see if I have a close-up. No, I don't there. But um, you can see number 10 here actually intrudes to, through two separate graves. And this little green one here was already busted up by number nine. So we've got people excavating graves on a different angle than their predecessors, digging into their predecessors, suggesting that they knew there was a cemetery here, but didn't quite exactly know where people were buried. In number 10 here is a large grave. We actually found, once we cleared off the bones at the bottom, we found two piles of bones on each side of the head. And those were from the two graves that number 10 had intruded. We also found number 15 here, I'll get to in a moment. But you know, this is the cemetery, presumably of uh, um, the Stevens family. But we know William and Magdalene weren't buried here because we know uh, by the late 1660s, they were starting to look at land over on Eastern shore and ended up establishing their plantation at Horn Point, uh, just sort of northwest of Cambridge. And here's actually Magdalene's stone, her ledger stone, which is now at the Episcopal Church Cemetery in Cambridge. They were actually Quakers. Uh, the stone, we, we know the stones were moved from their plantation at Horn Point uh, to the Episcopal Church Cemetery. I don't recall when. But you can see it says, here lieth uh, 
interred the body of Magdalene Stevens, spelled with a V, who uh, departed this life uh, November the 24th, Anio Domine 1673, I think it is. So the Stevens is, you know, we're out of there anyway. And the, the Tux and Point site seems to date into the 1680s. So they, there were definitely people who uh, occupied the plantation after they left. Uh, and as I recall, uh, William is stone is right next to her. It doesn't mean they're actually buried there, by the way. Just because somebody moves a stone doesn't necessarily mean they move the uh, skeletal remains. Well, here's that close-up I was looking for. So here's 10 that intrudes through these two graves and has bones piled up on either side of his head. We have number 15, which is out here, in, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, 14 over here. Why these people are separated from these clusters, we can't be sure. There's a hint with number 15 in that uh, this is the drawing that uh, Dennis Pogue, again, of uh, uh, Mount Vernon. He's now at University of Maryland, a professor in the uh, architecture or historic preservation or something like that. But he did this drawing. And while he was excavating, we're coming up with these little bones from the pelvic area. And you know, bones is what I do in archaeology. is one of the things I specialize in. And I didn't know what the hell they were. <laughs> And then you could see the light bulbs click in both of our heads at the same time. These are fetal bones. This woman died in childbirth uh, or just prior to childbirth and the fetus was still in her. And that may well be why she's buried apart from everybody else because in English lore, as in many cultures around the world, a woman who dies in childbirth before going through some sort of ritual cleansing is uh, impure. And certainly, you know, the child would be impure. And we see this in, in Christianity. The child has been baptized. Uh, so in a sense, it's kind of impure. So she's buried off to the side. It's really made it easy figuring out the sex of that person. And then we have this cluster of graves up here who almost certainly are laborers of some sort. Slaves, indentured servants, or some combination of the two. Uh, here are those graves excavated. You can still see the skeletal remains in the first one here. This one here was interesting because it's the only grave that produced something other than brass pins for you know, pinning the shroud closed. And some of these graves had coffins, so we'd find coffin nails, but no other artifacts. This body had a pipe that seems to have been clenched in the hands of the decedent. And there was also a uh, composite uh, material button down here too, which doesn't show in the photograph. There is the pipe, there is the button, uh, sort of copper alloy and something else going on there. But clearly this pipe was important to this person. Uh, like I said, the only person buried with anything. The forensic anthropologist at the Smithsonian identified this individual as of African descent the only one of 18 burials that appeared to be African. All the others tend, seemed to be European. That doesn't mean this person necessarily was a slave because they were indentured uh, Africans as well, but chances are uh, a slave. Uh, I don't remember whose head this is, but uh, um, again, I talked a little bit about this a few months ago. Uh, this is a classic you know, of a well-preserved 17th century cranium where you put the uh, mandible together with the maxilla and you put the teeth together and you get these nice round facets here. And top and bottom, they're just more obvious on the top. In some cultures, even today, people file their teeth. It's, uh, there are multiple meanings to it that I won't go into, but th these weren't purposeful. These are abrasions caused by clenching a clay tobacco pipe beneath the teeth all the time especially when doing hard manual labor. Uh, I, for one, when I smoked, always smoked cigars out in the field because tobacco leaf is nice and soft compared to the uh, hard stem of a tobacco pipe. But that's the, that's the damage that was caused. And if one of these people came up to you today alive and gave you a great big smile with their teeth together, you would see two perfectly round circles in their teeth. Now, obviously that was, you know, that could create problems. Uh, you can see the damage to these teeth. This is all eroded, all decay, missing teeth. 
uh, all decay over here, the enamel's gone. You can see the porosity, the little holes in the bone here, that's all from infection. Uh, this person may well have died from an infection that went to their brain from their teeth. Uh, that's not unusual to see that with an untreated dental abscess. So like I, I like to say, you know, this is a good case of point that smoking is no good for you. Okay, so anyway, we've got these two sites. Um, they're about 800 feet apart. Uh, the first one, the Comden site, dates to probably 1650s to 1670s. The Tuxen Point over here dates to probably the late 1650s, 1660s to 1680s. Um, it's very likely that William and Magdalene Stevens, their household occupied both, moving inland slightly, uh, but then decamped from here and moved to the Eastern shore. Uh, by that point, they already would have converted to um, Quakerism, Society of Friends. And like a lot of uh, Protestants and other sectarians, after the restoration of uh, the Baltimore family to the government of Maryland. You know, they basically kicked out throughout much of the 1650s. Uh, 1660, they uh, reasserted control just as King Charles II uh, was restored to the throne in England. Uh, and I suspect that was one of the reasons a lot of the Protestants beat it over to the Eastern Shore. They were putting some distance between themselves and the Catholic stronghold of St. Mary's. Um, that said, they were also looking for fresh land because all these lands were patented by people. And every planter who had children wanted to make sure that they got land for their children to farms, you know, something they could make a living on. And that would become increasingly difficult in the prime coastal areas of Calvert County. And so a lot of folks started bugging over to the Eastern Shore. And, but eventually more families moved in, they actually moved inland. So or we tend to find slightly later sites in the interior. Anyway, uh, that's kind of the story that we have here. Um, and I, you know, I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, you folks might have. Um, and I'll have to, I'll have to un uh, unshare this. Um, but this is part of a story that's unfolding. Again, we're revisiting this collection, the Compton Collection, and six or eight other uh, colonial uh, collections from colonial sites that I either excavated myself, or in the case of Compton, did a, a lot of uh, subsequent analysis. And we're looking at dietary patterns and a number of other things. So I'll happily answer any questions you might have. Jim, I have a couple for you. In that big uh, oyster pit that was like a trash area, mm -hmm. did they purposely, I know if you go and visit St. Mary's City, you know, there, there would be a trash pit right outside the kitchen door. Did they purposely put all their trash over in that one pit and then that's what they would work from when they put those poles in to build? You know, you said they backfilled. Mm -hmm. Did they save that trash in a particular place? I think um, with that particular pit, like a lot of these pits, they became, they were, you know, they're open holes. You got what you wanted out of them, you borrowed soil, and then they just were a hole. So they became a convenient place to throw trash. Okay. They're probably throwing trash elsewhere too, because it's not unusual for us to find, uh, uh, let's say, a, a shirt, a rim shirt from one of these large, uh, Spanish or Portuguese earthenware jars. And some of these things could be absolutely huge. And we'll find one small piece in a trash filled pit like that. Well, where the hell is the rest of the vessel? Or we'll find the foot bone or a tooth from a horse, but no other horse bones. Where's the rest of it? So the pits uh, aren't a, don't accurately represent all the things that these people threw out. They were probably throwing stuff elsewhere. Um, it is, Patuxent Point is different in that it seems to have, there, there's one or two smaller pits, but it has one really one, one big pit instead of a series of smaller ones. And I, I don't understand that at all. 
but as a whole, it just became a place to throw trash. And obviously, over a number of years, there were a lot of oysters in there. So is that where they would have collected the dirt that they backfilled with the poles? No, well, what they're doing is setting the pole in the ground. They're simply digging a hole, put the pole in, and backfilling the hole. Oh, with whatever dirt they had. Yeah. Not necessarily with trash. Yeah. The borrow pits are for, for soil that they're using to make plaster. The plaster, they're sort of wicker work type uh, hearths and, and uh, chimneys. Okay. Now, with trash being thrown out the nearest door or window, this is something we perpetuated a lot of historic sites and something I take exception to. There's a lot of stuff around the house that we recovered, you know, shards of glass, all kinds of trash. I'm pretty confident that stuff is being plowed up out of these features, the, the, these trash filled features. Most of the trash that these folks produced would have been kitchen waste. That kitchen waste would have been collected and thrown out to yard poultry, pigs, you know, it would be used as food. Now, cleaning that stuff up, you probably pick up the odd bit of glass or broken tobacco pipe. But for these people to be throwing out large amounts of broken crockery and stuff out the back door, it just doesn't cut the mustard with me. It, it <laughs> makes no sense. And it doesn't explain, well, if they're doing that, why are they also dumping the stuff in pits? It just doesn't, it's not consistent. So I think we've misread it, and that's because a lot of archaeology is done by people who come from backgrounds that are not farm backgrounds. Okay. You, know, you get food waste, you feed it to your livestock, or you use it for compost. You know, simply throw it out the back door. <laughs> that Probably. makes sense. Okay, I do have a few more questions. Um, this person, I don't know if they have realized what you, the area that you're talking about, but she said she missed the introduction. Can you please describe where this location is? It is in what is now a, uh, a residential development. I think it's a retirement community called Asbury, but it's on the north side of the Navy Rec Center in Southern Calvert County, basically Solomon's. So just above Point Patience, but there's nothing to see there, it's all gone. Okay. Um, where can we learn more about the Stevens family that you spoke about here? Uh, that's a tough part. There's a doctoral dissertation, which I'm sure is available at your local bookstore <laughs> or not. Um, there is an academic treatise, a, a monograph that I published, uh, which is available on, on eBay or Amazon or whatever for a couple bucks uh, used. Um, but it really isn't written for a general audience. It's written for people with very similar interests. I mean, it's in plain English. So I think it's comprehensible. It's just probably not gonna interest most people. Uh, we don't really have, this is one of many sites that have been excavated over the years by professional archeologists. It just really isn't available to the public other than through venues like this. And I'm sorry about that. And, and I am doing something to correct it. Are there any references to it on Wikipedia or any online references? I used to have a website. I think it was on there, but um, not a lot of detail. And I've since let that website lapse. And so I don't know if it's accessible anymore. Okay. Sorry. Um, there, are, there are websites but they, that have data for this site and many others, but they're really intended for uh, archaeologists to not particularly usable by the general public, but they're, they're accessible, I mean, they're free. Um, here's another question. What was found in the Native American feature? I guess in that pit. It's been a long time and um, it wasn't the focus of the analysis. I think we ended up with a bunch of pottery, probably so-called Rappahannock pottery, uh, you know, hand-thrown stuff uh, mixed with uh, crushed oyster shell as a temper. We recovered a lot of charcoal that we probably saved for future analysis, but I'm sorry, I just don't remember. Uh, the, the assistant Southern Maryland regional archeologist who sees himself, sees himself more as a, a, a prehistorian, as we call him, somebody who specializes in Native American history. Uh, that was an interest of his, I think he looked at it, I didn't. Is there anything that we can share in a follow-up email? to answer some of these questions? I have 
trouble envisioning exactly <laughs> what I would be able to produce quickly okay. in a succinct format that would be helpful other than sharing a recording of this talk. I mean, it's probably as definitive as you're going to find for a general audience at this point. Okay. But it really deserves, along with the other, it deserves a publication that is accessible and readable but that just that doesn't focus just on the site because one site by itself really isn't all that interesting. They become interesting when you start comparing them. And I bored folks for a couple of minutes by throwing up a couple of graphs to kind of make that point a little bit with the bones. But it's by looking at what people are doing across the landscape and the variability that where it really starts to become interesting. Uh, a book about just the site would, would bore most anybody. Okay. Um... That Susan is sharing this with everyone, Susan Langley, a Maryland woman expended 10 pounds worth of tobacco for hooks and eyes in six, 1643. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they were important. Okay, Susan, so you gotta put that in context now. <laughs> How many pounds of tobacco would a farm produce depending on number of labors? And the answer, I think, I think the number, we're looking at probably 2000 pounds of tobacco uh, 2000, I mean, in the 19th century, we got farms producing 30, even 40,000 pounds of tobacco. But in the 17th century, you're probably looking at 1,000 to 3,000 pounds of tobacco. So 10 pounds of tobacco isn't very much, except when you start adding it to all the other expenses, all the other stuff you're ordering from back in Europe, then you find that your, your revenue starts disappearing pretty quickly. Most of these people have lived in debt most of their lives. Well, and that makes me think of the um, the Dutch the Dutch pots. Where, were they getting these items from Europe? This is an this is another story I didn't touch on. But when the colony was founded, the charter said you will only trade with English ships and Eng through English ports, which means no Dutch. And in 1650. The, uh, the General Assembly and the Lord Baltimore passed the, uh, one of a series of, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, not in the colony, uh, the king, the crown, passed a, a law that said, in six, starting in 1650, that you could not trade with any but English ships through English ports or Irish ships in Irish ports or ships, uh, you know, sailed by Englishmen, that sort of thing. However, during the 16... Uh, 50s, England was at war with itself and with Scotland, and England and Scotland shared a king, you know, same guy. Uh, and during those English civil wars, there wasn't much in the way of trade coming over to the colonies. They sort of forgot about us. The Dutch were more than happy to move in, and there were, you know, there's no British Navy to prevent them from doing so. And not only did they supply the needs of the, of the settlers, but they did so on very generous credit terms. Uh, they bought up the tobacco, so it was great. The governor of Virginia, William Barclay, actually told the um, uh, board of the board of trade uh, back in England in the early 1650s, "Yeah, we're dealing with the Dutch because we need, you know, we need them, and there's nobody else to fill the need." So he was actually admitting that the colonists were in direct violation of the law. Okay. And so during this, it, once with the restoration, those navigation acts were then enforced quite stringently, and we have a series of Anglo-Dutch wars. Um, so when we find Dutch pottery, that uh, any kind of Dutch artifacts, it's pretty good indication that we're looking at deposits that formed in the 1650s. And then that stopped? That trade stopped? It looks like that it just hit a brick wall. <laughs> it just, boom, that's it. 1660, no more Dutch stuff. That's, that's interesting. All right, we have a few new questions. Let's see. Um, it's, we have a, a question about um, talks in this series. And basically, like Jim mentioned when we first started, it turns out about every, it's about every fourth Monday of the month. And so our next one is going to be April, I've got it written down. April 26th, and Jim's going to be talking about the archaeology of the New York State cheese factories in the 1860s to 1890s. So when I do my follow-up email tomorrow with the link for the recording, 
I'll go ahead and include the registration link. So anyone that wants to register for the next program can, can go to that link. And we have all of the programs are currently on the library website. If you go to our calendar, you can click on whatever um, program it is and the registration link will come up. So we have all of them ready right now, except for the ones starting in the summer. And those will go up in the next couple of days. So I hope that answers your question. I hope, you know, everybody uh, registers again because these talks are, are phenomenal. Um, here's another question. What are the ethical requirements for dealing with human graves and the remains after excavation? Well, there are, there are two sets of requirements. One is legal, uh, and that is we inform state's attorney's office. We get a certificate from the county health officer uh, to remove those remains and transport them. And then wherever those remains go, that certificate accompanies them. That's the legal aspect of it. And they're, they're you know, publishing notices and all that. With, with 350 year old graves, it simply wasn't an issue. At least I wasn't a part of that. That would have been Julie King dealing with that. Ethically, this was gonna become a storm water pond for the development. So those graves were coming out one way or another. Um, graves are really problematic. And for me as a research archeologist, by and large, they're not all that interesting. They take a lot of work to excavate. And the, the, the pathology team came up with all sorts of interesting insights into the individual remains, but they really weren't answering the kinds of questions I had. So it was a lot of extra work and really tedious and you know you always got to be careful you don't break anything it's just it's a lot of work and not much reward um it's 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 a problem more a problem when we're dealing with marginalized peoples when we're dealing with african-american graves native american graves any kind of uh particularly ethnic groups that have been marginalized you know because these are their people and we're taking them out of the ground and we're fulfilling our needs. I mean, I got a doctoral dissertation, large part out of this site, um, but the descendants of the Stevens family and whoever their successes were, I mean, what do they get out of it? So we're basically exploiting their past for our own purpose. The field has become much more sensitive to that in recent years. We are trying, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a long road to hoe. Um, and we do have these ethical discussions right now, we're revising our ethical principles for our archeologists in, in this country. So maybe one of the workshops we can do one day online is sort of, you know, the ethics in archeology. span It's actually a lot more fun than you think. I've done this for a number of years and I pose, I give you some background and I pose ethical scenarios and then you have to make a decision. And then I yell at you, no matter what you say, for making the wrong decision, <laughs> because generally there's no right decision. It's just ethical thinking, and um, so it's a lot of fun. Maybe we could do that at some point. Are they are they being reburied together, or are they all being taken to the Smithsonian? Or this particular set of remains, as far as I know, has been buried in the collections of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. Okay. Uh, but very often nowadays, what we're doing is. We're exhuming remains, we're having them studied, and then if we could find descendants, or whatever, we're reinterring them into a, an open cemetery with markers and everything. We did this with a cemetery up in Aberdeen, up in, uh, I guess it's Cecil County. Uh, seven graves from a family, their descendants were still around, we could find them. One of them actually worked for the Museum of Metropolitan Arts, so she was pretty savvy. And the developer had to pay to have the remains excavated analyzed and then reinterred in a local cemetery, uh, complete with whatever coffin remains we found with the bones. Uh, so that's probably more common today, mm -hmm. uh, but there are, you know, those people who specialize in the stuff, they like to hold on to these collections because they'll have few questions to ask, measurements they need to take, samples for DNA analysis, all sorts of things. So they're not real keen on letting them go very often. Um, that leads to this next question. Will the artifacts be displayed at some point in time? Some of them were briefly displayed at an exhibit in the uh, office of the realtor for the development. Hmm. Um, they are all, they're all 
curated at the, um, the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab in Port Republic, you know, just, just up river from the site, uh, Jefferson Patterson Park. Uh, I don't know if they've been exhibited lately, uh, certainly still being studied by people like me. Uh, the thing about collections, whether archaeological or not, a minute percentage of any museum's collections are ever on exhibit at any one time. I mean, the Smithsonian Museum has millions of objects. They don't have millions of objects on display. What they do is a curator decides on an interesting topic or is asked to do something, researches it, and then uses the research to develop an exhibit and determine what objects in the collection can be used and what objects have to be sought that are not in the collections and either have to be borrowed or acquired. So the museum world is, is uh, it's a little complicated. A lot of this stuff is simply curated in perpetuity and is used periodically by scholars and occasionally borrowed for exhibits. Reputable museums in the area can certainly borrow objects in the collection uh, if they have an exhibit in mind and have the appropriate curation and security uh, issues addressed. I have a, another question for myself. You mentioned that everyone rented their land from Lord Baltimore and then um, William and Magdalene moved to Calvert County. And then you talked about people wanting to have land so that they could um, pass it on to their descendants. When, when was the point where they could start buying this land? What year was that? The, the sixth and last Lord Baltimore, Frederick, started alienating land, selling it in fee simple. It's the phrase we, legal phrase we use today in the 1750s. Okay. Uh, by the time in the by the time of the American Revolution, there was still a lot of land he owned but had not sold, and was still renting out, and that was part of the problem after the Revolution. Is his uh, what we now what we call then illegitimate son Harry Harford came back to the colonies and tried to collect back rents and interest. Whole another story. Um, yeah, he wanted to pull out. He just wanted the cash. Uh, but until then, we have we have rent books these big ledgers that have for each county, they have all the plantations by name, William Stevens land, Compton, et cetera, and who, who's in possession of it, how many acres and what their rent is. And, and it's updated as new people come in. So those records are available to Maryland State Archives. Wow. Uh, but yeah, it was basically, a, it was a, supposed to be like a feudal manor. He was Lord of the Manor and we were not serfs, but tenants. And he made a lot of his money through the rents and through charging import and export duties. So if you had the land and you had sons, even though you rented the land, you could pass that on to your sons, the sure. rented land? Yeah, the legal term for it is usufruct. You owned the rights to use the land. Okay. And you could hold it in perpetuity as long as you paid your rent. And you could sell those rights to somebody else. The problem with the, Ste the Stevens probably confronted, as did many of their neighbors, is that they, they were boxed in by other neighbors and they had sons. And so they need to find land for them and preferably land close to the parents. So the best way to do that was to go to some area that was not heavily settled, acquire large tracts and divide it up. So I think that's what they had done. So if the Stevens left, um, who decided who who inherited that property? With it wouldn't be inheritance. Somebody would buy their rights to it, okay. uh, but we have no record of that. We don't know who they were. Um, it, in fact, Julie King doesn't agree with me with William Stevens. She thinks it was another person, John Obder, who I think actually owned the land a little bit further to the north. In any case, he he, he was getting into trouble with the Indians on the Eastern shore and got himself killed in the 1660s. So by the time the Stevens family bugged out, he was dead anyway. Uh, so we, we don't know who was there. We know the land remained. The next evidence of a tenant, I think was 1707 or 1727, something like that. There's a really a big gap in there that we can't account for. Okay. And you're accounting that by, from books. You're finding those facts from books. From the from rent the rolls, letters. yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I have another question. Any evidence of hogshead barrels or trails for getting tobacco to the water? Any other tobacco evidence? Um, 
the best evidence we have of tobacco is tobacco use, that is the tobacco pipes. A lot of these sites have thousands of uh, tobacco pipe fragments. Uh, a lot of these folks were living on the water, so they didn't have to transport the tobacco very far. They just you know, had to roll it to a, a few feet to a small shallop or catch that would then sail out to a bigger vessel and unload it. And that vessel then perhaps sailed out even further out into the middle of the bay and unloaded that cargo onto a transatlantic vessel. Uh, we don't have any remains of barrels and hogsheads that barrels they were using for tobacco would hold a thousand pounds. They were big barrels. Uh, so they probably didn't have much use uh, other than for tobacco. Smaller tobacco, uh, smaller barrels might be used to build, uh, to use as siding and uh, water wells and privies and stuff like that. Uh, but we haven't seen any evidence on these two sites anyway. Are you able to, when you um, excavate the sites, are you able to determine from the soil what was grown there? Not what was grown necessarily, although that's changing a little bit, but uh, we look at what's happened to that soil mm -hmm. uh, through cultivation and poor farming practices. You know, at Patuxent Point, you know, these structural post holes, they go down maybe two feet or less. And let's say we stripped off one foot by removing the plow zone, actually less than that. These posts still would have had to have gone deeper into the ground, which means we've lost a lot of surface. So, you know, almost anywhere in Maryland, you're standing on a surface that's anywhere from one to three feet, sometimes even more, lower than it was 150 to 300 years ago, because that soil has been eroded through poor farming practices and all sorts of other things redeposited somewhere else. So if you go downhill, you could be standing on a surface that's now three or four feet higher than it would have been 100, 200, 300 years ago. We are looking at pollen though, and at, at Smithsonian in, in the archeology span lab, citizen science have done, scientists are doing that. They successfully extracted pollen from soils from different layers in the deposit. They are on microscope slides. We have a camera ready. Uh, for high resolution photographs and uh, reticles for measuring the pollen grains. And we're ready to start photographing these things and sending them out to other citizen scientists to help us identify species and count the number of pollen grains of each species so we could see the changing vegetation over X number of years. But because of the plague, all that sort of came to a stop. And we're just, we have everything we need. We just need to be able to get people back in the lab so we can actually work on that. And that you said, said pollen, P-O-L-L-E-N. Right, plant okay. pollen that is the air right now is getting very rich with it wow. in spring. Um, that said, we didn't collect any pollen samples that I recall from mm -hmm. Tuxa Point because at the time we had no means of, we didn't have the funding to process it to just collect bags of dirt for no particular reason, it's not a good idea. Right. All right, um, here's one more question and then we should probably let you go. <laughs> we could probably talk all night. Have fun. Um, are you doing other current or future excavations? How do volunteers get involved? Well, we just finished the excavation in Bowie and this wasn't a Smithsonian pro uh, project, it was a, a private contract. And I'll be talking about that later this year, uh, the Go Plantation, uh, 18th century plantation site. At Smithsonian right now, we're doing a couple of things. We're, um, we're exposing what we think might be an unmarked cemetery identified by cadaver dogs. Oh. Um, a friend of mine trains cadaver dogs and trains people to train cadaver dogs. And she's been out several times and the dogs keep indicating on the same site. And while they, we were out there Saturday, one of the sites where we thought there might be a cemetery, they just they turned their noses up to, you know, there's nothing here, but they went back to the same place and keep uh, indicating. So we have a small crew that we can get on campus. We've been stripping off the topsoil by hand and trying to uh, delineate grave shafts. We also have a 1678 grave, I think, uh, gravestone in one part of campus. We're pretty sure there must be a 17th century site associated with it. As soon as we get some more bodies on campus, uh, we're going to try to find that site. And also 
try to see how many other graves are uh, by that stone. We're just which waiting. campus is that? This is Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, about 20 minutes south of Annapolis. You could just Google Smithsonian Environmental Research Center or contact me directly and I'll give you all you need. Um, so we have this, uh, you know, we've got lots to do there. We have all these projects we left hanging and folks just need to sign up. Uh, we, get, we get you a badge and um, put you to work. So is there a process? Do, do people have to go through an interview or anything in order to volunteer? That's wonderful. Uh, we don't. I mean, hard, you know, they got me working there as the director of the archaeology lab. <laughs> Clearly, they don't discriminate. So but we'll, we'll take anybody. Um, and whether or not you go through, go through the form, formal process of getting a badge, I would say come for a few weeks, decide whether or not this is something you like to do. You want to work with these folks. It's a great group of people. Some of them are actually on uh, this call here. And yeah, you just have a good time. And for younger folks, this is a great career advancement tool if you can afford some uh, one day during the week or one day on a weekend to work on research projects where you are in fact, you know, in effect a scientist uh, or a group of scientists, uh, getting the Smithsonian Institution on your resume. I and mean, that's the good housekeeping stamp of approval. Uh, that could open a lot of doors. Um, you know, plus you get the professional experience of doing the research and presenting it, maybe publishing. Uh, so for young folks, whether you're in high school or high school or, or high school or, or college, you know, it's, 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 or you can finish your bachelor's degree, it's a, a great thing to do. And for older folks, you know, whatever the hell reason you have for coming, you're welcome. Doesn't matter. We don't ask. That's wonderful. I'll, I'll go ahead and include that link tomorrow when I when I send out the recording link so that everybody has that. Great. And I'll also send out your email so that if anybody wants to get in touch with you with questions or comments, they can. Okay, um, good enough. There's, see, see, there's, there's one another person. question. Could you repeat where these rent books can be found? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe this person. They, they are at the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis. On oh, Robert the rent. Road. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. They, they are actually big ledgers. Uh, they may have them scanned at this point, but they're not online. You have to go into the archives and use their computer system to access the scans if they have a scan. Uh, right now, they're pretty much closed to most everybody, so you'll have to wait till they reopen. But they're there. The original patents are there. Uh, a lot of the stuff is scanned. That stuff which isn't scanned, they actually bring to your table and you handle period documents. It's it's, it's pretty amazing. I think that's a resource. You and I were talking about that when, before we started the program, and it's a resource that a lot of us don't really know about, but there is all kinds of history. I, I was telling Jim, we did a program last week with a Maryland author who wrote a book about someone during World War II, and all of a lot of the information that she used for her book was at the Maryland Archives. So I'll go ahead and send that link out in our follow-up email as well. Um, here's a comment. I noticed on the Compton plot map that Hungerford was listed on the bottom of three or four sections. Do you know the significance of that? Doesn't ring a bell offhand, but uh, Hungerford, the newer name for the creek, for one of the creeks was Hungerford. The other one was Helen, I think. Uh, the Hungerford family acquired a lot of that land around there later on, I think probably in the late 18th century, but I don't recall. Uh, they, what I was doing was reconstructing plats from the neighbors. Actually, that's how I figured out that it wasn't Compton. I spent weeks researching Compton and looking at the tracks around it before I actually went to the original patent for Compton and realized they made no mention of the stream. But I, that was back in the days when I did all that by hand with a protractor and a scale. Now I do it all on computers, so they look a lot nicer, and I can actually fit some of the stuff to current tax maps. Uh, but Hungerford was a big family around there. Uh, this is, um, I don't know if anybody is interested in this, but in your um, pictures that you showed us uh, of the grave plots, what did the colors mean? I know that the, the ones at the top that were pinkish, those you thought were servants or slaves, 
but what was the difference between the, the blue and the green? What I did was I measured the orientation. And that's one of the reasons I had a transit out there. Measuring the orientations in terms of degrees, azimuth, for each of the graves. And I was just looking for those that seemed to have the same orientation. Okay. And, and before I colored them in, though, I looked at how other graves intruded into them, sort of figure out the sequence. But they represent what I think are clusters based uh, pretty much just on orientation. It's just a visualization technique. I mean, it's, it's informed by some statistics, but it's not particularly high-powered high stuff. So it didn't have anything to do with the, um, the years that those graves were buried or the family members? No, but you can figure out a sequence of, for I guess, three of those clusters, which came first. Okay. So you can go, okay, this is the first household, the second household, the third household. The servants up at the north end of the site, we don't know, and the couple of outliers that aren't part of any of the clusters, we don't know. But certainly in that main cluster, you could figure out a sequence of probably three households. So then you can also assume that the other properties had the same type of cemeteries on their properties. Each family had their own cemeteries. Uh, by similar. and large, yeah, that would be true. As we get into the later colonial period, you get more in a way of Quaker meeting grounds, uh, Quaker meeting cemeteries, and Episcopal church cemeteries. But certainly in the 17th century, these folks didn't go far. Mm -hmm. And I would say typically within 100 to 300 feet of the plantation house is where you're going to find the cemetery. Now, how, how would somebody who had just come over for, from England, how would they be able to get one of these tracts of land? Did it matter who you were or when you came over? Or? If they transported themselves, that is, they paid, it was about six pounds sterling it cost for food and everything for the voyage. If you paid your own way, then you didn't owe anybody anything. If you, uh, and you were also eligible for initially, you had the right to uh, request 100 acres, later it was reduced to 50 acres. And that meant mm -hmm. you can pay to have that acreage surveyed and get a patent on it. And then you had to pay the semi-annual semi rent. If somebody else paid you away, then you were an indentured servant and you worked for them you know, three to seven years till you paid off your debt. And then all you would get would be a barrel of corn, a, a, a hoe, I think, and a suit of clothes, something like that. It wasn't very much. You did not have any rights to land. That was a common misconception even at the time. People thought if they served their indentures, term of indentures that they would then be eligible for this land and they weren't. In reality, it didn't make much, it didn't matter that much. Land was cheap. Mm -hmm. It didn't cost that much. Uh, what cost a lot was setting up a household to the point where you can produce enough tobacco and food for your household to mm -hmm. make a go of it. It's, it's, there's a lot here to learn. Every time you give one of these programs, there's just more and more information that comes out, Jim. We're, we're only scratching the surface on any of these topics. And a lot more people have been working on it and for a lot longer than I have. And a lot smarter too. I mean, there are a lot of historians who were working on this in the 70s and 80s, produced all kinds of great books, uh, really provide us a lot of the insight that informs what people are like me do afterwards. And then there's a lot of archeology span going on. I mean, St. Mary City, you know, if you read the papers, they just finally, after I don't know, 50 years, found the fort, the original 1634 fort. Uh, there's stuff like that going on all the time. Um, and we all just contribute our little pieces and hopefully we'll end up with some sort of meaningful puzzle when we're through. It's amazing. We, we really appreciate you sharing this information because like you said, you know, it, a lot of this for us is word of mouth because we can't access it. But then it, it opens up, you know, an, a whole other area of interest where you hear about a particular family or a particular way that they um, sold land or rented land. And then it just opens up another door of research that somebody might want to follow. So we really Join appreciate us at Smithsonian. <laughs> Join us at CERC. You could be part of the discovery. It's, it's amazing. Um, okay, here's one more question. What is one thing you would like fourth grade students studying Colonial Maryland to know? It's an interesting question. 
I don't know if this is suitable. I, I don't. I've never. I've never had kids, so I. You know, I'm not I don't necessarily. Think like St. Mary's in Calvert County. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things I hear a lot. Uh, people often complain that oh, there's so much regulation over what we can do with our own property these days, and we need to go back to the old days when you can do whatever you wanted to. And the reality is that that was never true. In, in Maryland, you know, if you patented land, you were required to build a dwelling on it that measured at least 20 feet on a side. It was you know, heated, that's what made the dwelling, within I think three years of patenting. And if you didn't, that land returned back to Lord Baltimore, you know? And there were all kinds of other rules about what you could do and everything. So one of the interesting things we can learn from the history, apart from just archeology, span is get a better sense of where we've been and where we are now. There are no halcyon days of your, uh, when, when everybody was free, you know? Uh, it, it, it's just not true. And one of the things, one of the things they might that's worth for to expose young people to, is the so-called uh, Act of the Toleration Act of 1649 that supposedly introduced religious freedom to Maryland, and we've celebrated that for you know a couple of centuries now. Well, when you sit down and actually read the Act, it says, yeah, you have freedom of belief; nobody can bother you as long as you recognize the Trinity. And you know the existence of the Holy Ghost, and you know if you don't, then you could be executed and all your all your property taken away, which means your family is left destitute and would have to be broken up, and they'd have to indenture to other plantations. Pretty harsh punishment for anybody who's Jewish, Muslim, an animist, or just an atheist. Uh, they weren't that tolerant, and so I think that's an interesting thing for students to learn. Well, not fourth graders and not, I don't know. I mean, you're probably a better judge of that than I. Yeah, we touched on the Toleration Act. It should be called the Intoleration Act. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's institutionalized at the state capitol, and it's something that, you know, people have written about and bragged about for years, and Maryland's a leader in all this. When you actually read the law, it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's not what it says. Uh, what it does is it helps it helped ameliorate the, well, actually it didn't really work anyway, but it was supposed to uh, ameliorate some of the tensions between Catholics and Protestants. And by Protestants, I mean Anglicans. Um, that's all. You know, it wasn't any flash of enlightenment. It was a political act to try to cool things down, and it didn't work. That's amazing. How far we've come. Yeah, how much farther we have to go too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Sometimes you feel like we haven't come very far. Well, Jim, I really appreciate your talk this evening. If anyone else has a last minute question, um, feel free to speak up. And otherwise, please sign up for Jim's um, talk next month. It'll be April 26th. And thank all of you for coming tonight. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. you. Guys, take care. See you All next right. month.